Hello, welcome. Uh, we are here at the session taking on white supremacy, the Charlottesville case. The session will start in just a moment. I want to remind everyone that the session is being recorded. Um, I also want to direct you with how to ask questions during our session. Um, please put your questions into the chat and we will gather them for the Q&A at the final segment of our session. And if you are having any tech challenges, please drop them into the chat and the room host will help you. Um, we will also start identifying ourselves uh, each time we speak to make it easier for the closed captioning process to work well. Um, that may be a new sound for some of you. It is for me. So um, we're all going to be in this um, good experiment together. And with that, um, I would just like to introduce myself and my co-presenter here today. My name is Dove Kent, and I am the Senior Strategy Officer with Ben the Ark Jewish Action. And I am here today with Amy Spotelnik from Integrity First for America. And we are looking forward to talking with you this hour about a key strategy that is being waged against the neo-Nazi movement and how this fits into the broader struggle against white supremacy in this country and beyond. Um, and before we get into it more fully, uh, I actually just wanna invite everyone to take a breath. Um, this is uh, going to be a session where we're going to be talking about um, some important tactics and strategies and thinking about all of that through together. And we want to make sure that our systems are aligned as we are doing that. And um, I have found personally that breathing is an excellent strategy uh, to keep me awake and focused. So I uh, want to encourage folks to um, take some intentional breaths as we are going through our session today. Um, and uh, with that, um, I am actually just going to start, but um, uh, Amy, would you like to just uh, introduce yourself a little and say hello, and then we'll, we'll jump into it together? Absolutely. And I know folks are still joining the session, so we will do sort of a, a slow roll into the substance as people continue to get logged on. Um, I know this is the first session of the entire conference, so... Thank you for, for making this your first stop at Netroots. Um, my name is Amy Spitalnik. I am the executive director of a small civil rights nonprofit um, called Integrity First for America. Um, we are suing the neo-Nazis and white supremacists responsible for the violence in Charlottesville, which happened exactly three years ago this week. Um, in my prior lives, I worked, uh, in my prior life, I worked in government, politics, and advocacy, um, including uh, as the communications director and senior policy advisor to the New York Attorney General um, and uh, in the New York City Mayor's Office, and many years ago as J Street's first press secretary, because I've decided to only focus on the easy issues in my career, neo-Nazis and Israel. Um, and uh, I am so thrilled to be here. Um, and looking forward to this discussion, to sharing our work with you and to um, making sure that we can also get to as many questions as possible later. Thank you, Amy. And just wanna to say to everyone again, welcome. Welcome to Netroots. Um, as Amy just uh, said, it's the, it's the first session, it's the first morning. We are on together um, virtually instead of in person, but we are still here as a community together um, at a very critical moment. And just going to um, run through some announcements to get us all settled. Um, we are here together at the session, taking on white supremacy, the Charlottesville case. And we um, are recording the session and uh, for those of you who want to ask questions during the session, uh, please put your questions into the chat and we will gather them for the Q&A at the final segment of our session. 
And uh, please drop any tech challenges that you have into the chat and our room host will help you with those. Um, and I should start now. My name is Dove. Uh, we will be identifying ourselves each time we speak, or trying to, uh, to make it easier for the closed captioning process to work well. Um, and so I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dove Kent, and I am the Senior Strategy Officer with Ben the Ark Jewish Action. And again, I'm here with Amy Spitalnik from Integrity First for America. And we are looking forward to talking with you this hour about this important strategy that's being waged against the neo-Nazi movement and how it fits into the broader struggle against white supremacy in this country and beyond. And as we get started, um, would love again for folks who have just logged in to uh, take a breath. Might encourage you to do that a few times this session. Uh, and for us to just keep breathing together, because uh, we've got we've to get through this together and we've got to be well as we do it. Um, so I am going to just do a little bit of um, setting the stage for us today to talk about this important strategy. And a key piece that I want to um, have us to be versed in together is the concept of a system versus a movement. And the reason for this is that we need different tactics and strategies to fight a system than we do a movement. So getting clear on the difference will enable us to correctly assess the most impactful actions that we can take. So we want to start by thinking about white supremacy as a system, right? And for some of you, um, this is uh, very familiar. In fact, violently familiar. Mm -hmm. So white supremacy is the system of institutions and ideologies that was established in Europe and exported around the globe to benefit white people on the backs of black and brown people. It was established four or 500 years ago to justify the colonization of contents, genocide, and the enslavement of Africans. And it came about as a state project. It was sanctioned by the church, and it's continued to be a form of social control and disparities to exploit indigenous people, black people, brown people, immigrant people, in addition to poor white people. And it's built to maintain the political, cultural, economic, social domination of people identified as white. And all of that is in the context of a system. And we know that that plays out in the criminal justice system uh, or injustice system, as we may call it. It plays out in the health system, in the school system. This is the fabric of our lives. What we wanna turn today to look at the social movement that came out of this system, that re-emerges out of this system in each generation. And the current social movement today that re-emerged after the civil rights movement. And the adherents of this white nationalist and white supremacist movement believe that white identity should be the organizing principle of the countries that make up Western civilization. They advocate for policies that are about reversing the changing demographics in our country. And they're trying to fight against this idea of the loss of an absolute white majority. And so things like ending non-white immigration is an urgent priority for these folks because they're trying to preserve a white racial hegemony. And these racist aspirations are often disingenuously couched as proclamations for love of members for their own race, rather than being about power and control. And something that we really want to focus on is that this is indeed a movement rather than um, the systems that people may be part of, whether or not they're choosing to be. Folks at the lead of this movement, they went and studied civil rights materials. They went to the Highlander Center to learn how they won. And they're using a lot of the same tools that we use to build our movements. Base building, leadership development, absorption, campaigns. 
This is an active movement that we are up against. And that is one of the reasons that we need to think very, very specifically about strategies that are countering this from a movement perspective. And with that, I actually want to um, show a video from Integrity First for America um, that grounds us in the anniversary or commemoration that we are currently in this week, um, and that also sets the stage for the work that Amy is going to tell you about. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you all. who were injured in Charlottesville, including three of the people who were hit by that car and survived, have now brought a lawsuit against not only the murderer who drove his vehicle into the crowd, but also the leaders of all of the white nationalist groups that organized and promoted the Charlottesville event. We are Integrity First for America. We are here to disrupt the extremism, to interrupt the cycle, to dismantle and bankrupt these hate groups and their leaders to put them out of business, and most importantly, to stop the violence. Integrity First for America is leading the fight against white supremacy. Our Charlottesville lawsuit is the only current legal effort taking on the broad leadership of this movement, holding white supremacists accountable for their premeditated violence. We know that it's working. They're already facing huge financial and legal consequences, but we also know what we're up against. Bankrupting Nazis isn't cheap. These groups are still recruiting, weaponizing fear, and preparing for their next attack. Now more than ever, we are reminded of our obligation to dismantle the systems of white supremacy that poison this country. Turn your outrage into action, because hate has no place here. Okay, I want to invite another breath. And uh, Amy, can you give us an overview about this strategy that you are taking against the movement? Uh, this is Amy speaking. Uh, so there's so much to say about this case, about what happened in Charlottesville three years ago and how it ties into the broader fight against white supremacy and white nationalism in America. I'll give a quick overview and then in the course of this discussion, um, I'm sure we'll touch on a lot more of that. Um, what's so important to understand is that what happened in Charlottesville three years ago this week was not an accident. Um, the violence that we saw first on Friday, August 11th, where neo-Nazis and white supremacists carrying tiki torches, which were meant to evoke the KKK and the Nazis, descended on the University of Virginia, terrorizing students, ultimately surrounding a small group of peaceful counter-protesters at the Thomas Jefferson statue on campus where they threw fuel and lit torches, kicked, punched, beat them up. One of our plaintiffs, an African-American UVA student, said he thought he was going to die that night. Um, the violence, of course, continued throughout the weekend. Um, we saw some of, those, some of those images in that video, um, which I think three years later is still horrifying, as horrifying to me as it was three years ago. Um, they surrounded the small local synagogue, chanting Sikh Kyle, carrying semi-automatic weapons. One of the details that always gets me is that the synagogue was home to a Torah scroll that was saved from Nazi Germany. And in 2017 in America, it was once again under Nazi threat. Um, they charged a line of interfaith clergy, including Cornell West and our plaintiff Reverend Seth Wispelway. Um, and ultimately the day culminated with James Fields driving his car into a crowd of peaceful protesters who were walking home that day, um, killing Heather Heyer, injuring many others, including our plaintiffs, Marcus Martin, who is the African-American man you can see sprawled across the back of the car in that iconic photo of the attack, his then fiance, now wife, Marissa, 
Natalie Romero, who you saw in that video, whose skull was shattered, um, and a number of others who were grievously injured, both physically and emotionally, and, and many are still recovering three years after the fact. And so, as I said, nothing that happened that weekend was an accident. Rather, it was planned for months in advance, particularly on social media, namely on a platform called Discord that I suspect many of you might be familiar with. It's typically used by video gamers to chat while they're playing a game. Um, it was co-opted by the leaders of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville for planning purposes. And in these chats, um, they discussed everything from the mundane. What do we wear? What do we bring for lunch? Will mayo spoil in the sun? How do you best sew a swastika onto a flag? It really was sort of the banality of evil, as uh, Hannah Arendt calls it. And um, of course, also the, the sick. They talked about which weapons to carry, how they wanted to crack commie skulls, how they could use things that might appear like, quote, free speech instruments, like poles, like flagpoles, as weapons. Um, and they even discussed hitting protesters with cars and then claiming self-defense, which is, of course, precisely what they did. Um, and in July of 2017, a month before the violence, there was a horrific chat in which um, someone, one of the leaders said, I'm, quote, I'm not just shit posting. I'm serious. What is Virginia law about you know, hitting protesters if they're in the roadway. And they shared a meme um, that showed John Deere's protester digester intended to illustrate hitting protesters with a vehicle. Um, we'll get back to this, I'm sure, later in the session. But the fact that three years later, we're seeing a horrific rise in car attacks, many of them fueled by memes like the one we saw in these chats, is not an accident much like what happened in Charlottesville wasn't an accident. This is a deliberate strategy of the white supremacist movement in America right now. Um, and so on behalf of the Charlottesville community members who were injured in the violence, we are suing two dozen neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and hate groups who were responsible for orchestrating what happened. There were hundreds of extremists in Charlottesville, and it wouldn't have been easy or doable or the right legal strategy to take on all of them. What this case specifically does, using chats that were leaked via Unicorn Riot, which is a journalism nonprofit some of you might be familiar with, and of course we've since subpoenaed those chats from Discord and other platforms. We've used those chats to identify the specific leaders responsible for orchestrating what happened. Um, we are suing them not under speech pretenses or even incitement. Rather, this is a conspiracy case using a number of civil rights statutes um, including something called the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which is exactly what it sounds like. It was first passed by the Reconstructionist Congress to hold accountable um, Klan vigilantes in the South who were terrorizing recently freed slaves nearly 150 years ago. Um, the fact that 150 years later, we are still using it to hold accountable quite literally KKK groups who are some of our defendants um, and a number of other white supremacists is just a sad testament to the reality of the world we're living in right now. And I will just conclude by saying, unsurprisingly, and I'm sure this is unsurprising to many of you, the leaders and groups responsible for what happened in Charlottesville are also the leaders and groups at the center of this violent white supremacist movement in America. And so we see deep disturbing connections between them and the broader cycle of violence over recent years. We know that the Pittsburgh shooter who killed 11 Jews praying in synagogue nearly two years ago communicated on Gab with some of the Charlottesville leaders before his attack. We know that the Christchurch shooter who killed dozens of Muslims praying in mosque in New Zealand last year um, painted onto his gun a white power symbol that was popularized by one of our defendants. Christchurch in turn inspired Poway and El Paso, Paso being the deadliest attack on the Latinx community in recent American history. And even now, during both coronavirus and the Black Lives Matter protests, we see over and over again attempts by our defendants to spur violence, disinformation, and other um, terror. Um, there's, there's so many examples there, and I think um, we'll drop into the chat a summary of these efforts. Um, but one that might be of particular interest to folks is um, Identity Europa, one of the white supremacist groups we're suing was the group behind the now viral tweet that purported to be Antifa and urged violence and looting in white neighborhoods earlier this summer. And that in turn led to armed white men showing up in communities under the guise of fighting Antifa, protecting from Antifa. Um, 
And again, we see over and over again, the same tactics in Charlottesville um, that were used in Charlottesville come into play here. Disinformation, trying to blame Antifa for violence. Um, and of, uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the horrific rise in car attacks, including many that we've seen in recent months targeted at protesters, um, including just up the road from Charlottesville in Richmond, where a KKK leader was just put in prison for six years for hitting protesters earlier this summer. So there's so much to say about this case, but I will just end by noting that by going after these groups, these leaders that are at the center of the movement, we're not just gonna hold them accountable for what happened in Charlottesville, but we have the ability to bankrupt and dismantle them, which will have ripple effects that go well beyond Charlottesville and set a clear precedent and message and deterrent that if you are part of these violent racist conspiracies, you will face very severe consequences. Thank you, Amy. Um, for bringing us all into that and for this work that you're doing. I um, want to also, again, invite folks to take a breath. Um, you know, we've, we started talking about some of the ideology of these groups, and I'm wondering, you know, through this this case, through um, the information that you've subpoenaed, what have you been learning about some of the ideology of these groups and what would it be helpful for us as a Netroots community to, to know along with you? There's, again, like with everything that we're talking about, there's so much to say here. So I'll try to um, stick to some top lines and I know you also have uh, a ton of expertise in this space. So please jump in. Um, so, you know, when you hear things like Jews will not replace us, or when you see manifestos like the ones we've seen come out of Pittsburgh and Christchurch and El Paso and so many other horrific attacks, there are some very clear through lines, not just the connections between the people and the groups that I illustrated, but this ideology. And while there are certainly minor, minor probably from our perspective, major from their perspective, but while there are certainly differences in the movement, um, in terms of specific ideologies, some of the details of their goals. At the end of the day, many of them are motivated by the idea, of, by a, a fundamental white supremacy and the idea that they want some sort of white ethno state that um, any, probably all of us on this, on this Zoom right now would not fit into their vile vision for. Um, many adhere to something called the great replacement or replacement theory. So that is quite literally what they mean when they say Jews will not replace us. Um, and talk about the uh, the genocide of the white race. So this is the same ideology we've seen in so many of these white supremacist attacks in recent years. And while there are some small di differences between um, different versions of the theory, it generally goes like the white race is being replaced by black and brown people. In many cases, Jews are the puppet masters behind that. And that's what they mean when they say Jews will not replace us or you will not replace us. Um, and so, it's that ideology that directly fuels so many of these attacks. And for example, the Pittsburgh shooter specifically chose the synagogue he attacked because they partner with HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which is a nonprofit that works with refugees of all backgrounds to support them as they're coming to the United States. Um, you know, the El Paso shooter drove, I think, 10 hours out of his way to target a Latinx community because it was about this idea black and brown people are replacing the white race in Texas and around the country. And there's so many other horrific examples like that, that um, I, I mean, I don't recommend reading, but if you're looking to, to understand this better, uh, you know, there's no shortage of examples along those lines. And what's also important to understand about this ideology is the way in which social media has allowed it to grow and thrive. And I know we're gonna get to this in a second, um, but so many of the memes so many of the, um, the fundamental arguments and ideology that are play here have spread rapidly through social media through, and that is why this movement is not like it was 150 years ago when the KKK Act was first passed, relegated to specific pockets of the country. In the past, white supremacists used to be able to operate in their specific regions, and it was heinous and horrible and violent, but they were limited in their reach. They targeted specific communities, generally where they, they lived, around the woods where their clans, their clan dens existed. Now, because of social media, they're able to connect across the country and around the globe 
um, spread this heinous ideology and then inspire each other to action, which is exactly what has happened in so many of these cases, as, as I described. Charlottesville appears to have inspired um, Pittsburgh and Christchurch, which in turn inspired Poway and El Paso. And you see in the manifestos that these extremists published, both the great replacement theory that I just described and the ways in which they were so directly inspired to action by engaging in it online. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. Um, oh, this is Dev again. Um, we, I, I want to jump on that and um, connect it to um, just really the ways in which these, um, these messages, these ideologies, as you were saying, have also been moving from the margins to the mainstream um, through this. Um, that example that um, you gave about the, um, the, the shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, um, the meme that um, had the uh, ideas of um, Soros, uh, a, a you know, Jewish philanthropist backing the migrant caravan um, that was moved from the margins to the mainstream by Representative Matt Gates in Florida um, and then picked up by Trump. Um, and Gates went uh, really doubled down on it over the course of uh, just about two weeks. Um, and by the time that the, um, the shooter had spread the meme and then gone into the synagogue, uh, that I, this either, you know, um, verbally or visually, this picture of Jewish philanthropists um, putting American white people in danger through a migrant caravan had reached 670 million people um, on social media. And so this is this moment where um, folks who are those uh, linchpins in a way um, between, um, wait, I'm just, you know, when you say a word and then uh, you kind of think, what is the etymology of that word linchpin? Okay, I need to look into that. Um, but folks who are the, um, who are positioned um, as Matt Gates has positioned himself um, between the margins and the mainstream really bringing this out um, spreads it not only to the people who are looking for this, but um, for the people who are vulnerable to it as well. Um, and that's something I want to talk a little bit about. Um, I have had some good conversations um, with Derek Black. Some of you might know his name. Um, he was part of the neo-Nazi movement very intimately, was raised in it as a child, um, and then as a young adult, um, stepped out of the movement um, in a very um, brave way and um, has spoken out against it since. And he would talk about how, um, you know, when folks were doing base building for the movement, they didn't have to find people who had extremist ideologies already. Um, you just had to have a little bit. He said that, you know, he was taught and would teach others that people just have to say, I'm not racist, but, and then you take that but, and you just pull that thread and you pull it and you pull it and you pull it. And that's how people are brought into um, these movements. Um, also just kind of backing up and really looking that this is a right-wing populist political strategy that Trump and his party are utilizing. You know, it's, it plays on people's suffering by pointing to an already marginalized group as the source of their suffering and positioning the leader as the one who will save them. Um, and linked to that, I actually wanna share another video um, that was just put out this week by Ben the Ark. And this shows how um, statements that were shocking only three years ago in what Amy's been talking about have become normalized by politicians like Trump and Matt Gates today um, who are using this right-wing populist strategy to build power. Um, so I'm going to share this uh, video with you now. Trump and his allies are sounding a lot like the Nazis who marched on Charlottesville three years ago. In 2017, these deadly events shocked us all. Today, their rhetoric is just as shocking. You remember these guys. Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! 
or people like Richard Spencer. We will not be replaced! Today we're hearing the same replacement language from Republicans. Here's Florida Rep Matt Gates. The left wants us to be ashamed of America so that they can replace America. We will not be replaced! White nationalists believe in something called replacement, a racist and anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that says non-white people are taking over the country and causing a supposed white genocide. Now, Gates didn't say anything about a cultural genocide, but Oh wait. There is an attempted cultural genocide going on in America right now. This is a great country. It is worthy of our pride and our defense. American pride, huh? We're here to stand for Robert E. Lee because they're removing the Robert E. Lee statue. We're here to say that we're here to defend our heritage. We will never allow an angry mob to tear down our statues, erase our history. American history? We are simply just white people that love our uh, heritage. The founding fathers who were white. Ah, see, when people say things like cultural genocide, Side. They're referring to the same white supremacy as the Nazis three years ago, thinly disguised as a pride for American values and history. The ethnic cleansing of America and the destruction of the American way of life. We will defend, protect, and preserve American way of life. And Republicans have also adopted the white nationalist pattern of deflecting blame for the violence they stoked themselves, pointing the finger at anti-racist protesters. The radical left is getting more violent every single day. The radical left wants to tear down everything in its way. Armed militant left-wing radicals. Radical left criminals, thugs, and others. If there was any doubt what they mean when they say radical left. Radical left, corporations in the state are all on the same Trump. Jewish side. Trump is currently running for re-election sounding like a neo-Nazi. These aren't just words. This rhetoric has fueled real violence against Jews and other communities. Hate crimes are up. We were frightened in 2017 and we're frightened now. But we can change this. It's time for all people of conscience to rise up and push these people out of power in November. Together, we can build a country that's truly for all of us. We rise as one. I should add that that uh, video was made for a Jewish audience if people were interested in the uh, images at the end that showed uh, Jews in support of the Black uprising. Um, Jews of all races and ethnicities were part of that movement, but for that, the, speci the specificity of that um, is the reason. Um, so uh, we have seen this ideology, we have this grounding of where this is, this is coming, where this is going. Um, so I want to get a little bit deeper into um, the parts of the strategy that you are moving forward. Um, and I, um, you know, you've said how, you know, looking back three years ago, it's clear that Charlottesville was a preview of things to come and that this has been a turning point. Um, so I think I'm interested in some of the specifics of how is this, um, how is the strategy you're using part of the broader struggle against racism in America? How does a legal strategy fit in with some of the organizing strategies that um, some folks that are in the session with us may be more familiar with? Um, well, I think the two videos that we showed almost perfectly illustrate how what happened three years ago has really fueled the broader cycle of violence that I described and now is increasingly part of the mainstream. And what struck, strikes me about the video we just watched is how many of our defendants are on the left side of the screen um, sharing their heinous white supremacist and white nationalist talking points that are then echoed by Trump and Gates and others. Um, and it really is a perfect, you could see that through line that we've been talking about so clearly there. Um, because again, the people in that video, the Matthew Heimbox and Richard Spencers were central to what happened in Charlottesville and central to this broader movement. Um, there are so many tools and tactics that were in place in Charlottesville that have now become mainstreamed um, among white supremacists and as, as again mentioned really increasingly among, you know, those you would not necessarily put in the bucket of violent white supremacists, but increasingly espouse their ideology. Um, I think one, the role of social media, it, it's so important to underscore this. And I know we'll, we'll probably talk about this in more detail and I'm sure folks have questions. Yeah, go for it now. This is great. Um, Look, I, I explained how social media was co-opted to plan in explicit detail the violence in Charlottesville. And I mentioned how it was used to then inspire others to action through the live streaming of things like the Christchurch attack, the promulgation of these ideologies. Um, and you know that the next disaffected, typically white man is 
watching, looking on, and waiting for the moment where he too can make a name for himself in this movement with a violent attack like the ones we've seen. And understanding how, how much, frankly, social media companies across the board have failed us in this regard, in the sense that for, in some cases, decades, extremism has been able to run rampant on these platforms. In some cases, like Discord, Facebook, Twitter, and otherwise, the sites aren't built with the intent to uh, become hubs for extremism, but they have not taken action to do much about it. Some have, as we all know, recently started to take some actions like Twitter. Um, others like Facebook have been pretty staunch in their refusal to do so. Um, either way, it's not sufficient. Um, and then of course, there are those that are quite literally building business models on becoming platforms for extremism, like 4chan, 8chan, um, rebranded as 8kun, um, Gab, Telegram, Telegram being an, uh, a very popular site among our defendants and many of their supporters currently. Um, it's where they have, our defendants and their supporters have quite literally threatened our team um, and where they keep a list of Jews that um, are speaking out against white supremacy. I'm on it, I suspect you might be too. Um, it uh, is a delight. So, you can't talk about what's happened in recent years without understanding the role of social media and the fact that if these platforms wanted to get serious, they could start to do something about this. No social media platform is obligated to give plat a platform to extremism and violence, period, end of story. That's not what the First Amendment requires. These are private companies. They could set the ground rules, just like Netroots as a private conference can set the ground rules, uh, and much like any other private entity can do so. If these extremists want to stand on the street corner and shout their bigotry, they are welcome to. But no one, whether it be a social media company or traditional media outlet or anything else, needs to give them license to do so. And it's so important that we say that clearly and keep holding them to account um, in whatever ways we can. Um, there's also been the ways in which disinformation, um, particularly around who's to blame for violence, has become so central to how these groups operate. And, and the video that we just watched talks about this as well, um, both in Charlottesville. And of course, right now we are seeing finger pointing at Antifa. Um, CSIS, which is an incredibly reputable um, research institution put out a study a few weeks ago that showed that the anti-fascist movement has killed exactly zero people in the last 25 years. While white supremacists are I think the most deadly extremist group operating in the United States in recent years. Um, and so when you hear both these white supremacists and organ leaders and groups themselves and the politicians who oftentimes, um, you know, dovetail with their talking points, point fingers at Antifa, it is simply a means to distract from the far right violence that it's literally killing people in communities across this country. And we can't lose sight of that. That is so important to understand and to call out and to not fall prey for, to hold the media to account to not fall prey for too. Um, similarly, the same disinformation tactics, um, we see sort of fuel that. I mentioned earlier, one of our defendants, Identity Europa, was behind a viral tweet that purported to be Antifa and urged violence and looting in white neighborhoods. Um, there have been a number of disinformation efforts like this, whether it be explicit attempts to blame Antifa um, and to paint the paint the imagery of it being Antifa. Um, in other cases, there have been efforts to create fake Jewish or Black Twitter accounts that have been meant to sow tensions between communities so that we're focused on fighting between our, our communities as opposed to taking on the white supremacy that is targeting all of us. Um, and there's so many other examples in this regard. I know that uh, I'm sure many of the people watching here have been grappling with it in their own work as it relates to extremists trying to distract and deflect from the issues at hand, which particularly right now is so crucial during a much needed public reckoning on racial justice. Um, and then of course, there's the ways in which we continue to fail to identify white supremacy as the crisis it is. is it, and, and this is something that has in some ways only gotten worse over recent years, despite the number of white supremacist attacks growing. Um, we already know from the beginning of the Trump administration, um, putting aside their own rhetoric and winks and nods and increasingly explicit language, um, they were actively disinvesting from the programs that were meant to combat violent extremism in America. 
So in some cases, that's the Department of Justice cutting civil rights investigations and prosecutions by nearly two thirds, as Vice reported last year, two thirds from the end of the Obama administration to 2019, which is pretty horrific. And by the way, makes private plaintiffs like ours all the more relevant because DOJ is not taking action like it would in normal times. Um, and it also means cutting other programs that would go a long way towards treating this as the urgent national security crisis it is. Um, at the same time, basic legislation that would ensure cooperation between different levels of government, for example, uh, grapple with the threat of white supremacy in our military and how that has become an increasing um, pattern um, have been languishing in Congress. There has been so little effort and action around bills that deal with hate crimes um, and domestic terror, putting aside the question of a domestic terror statute, which is convoluted and probably best saved for another discussion. Um, but some of the most basic actions have sort of languished for years. And so when we are grappling with a major national security crisis and a crisis that is directly impacting our democracy when it comes to violent extremism, disinformation, and hate, and then you have the federal government actively disinvesting in every way possible from, from dealing with it, it's only going to get worse. And that is exactly what we've been seeing. Um, and of course, and I know there are many other sessions happening this weekend on this topic, it is directly connected to so much of the disinformation and concerns around the election. Um, and so understanding how this fits into that broader crisis, that broader narrative is also key and has been crystal clear um, that Charlottesville really was the flashpoint in which so many of these tools and tactics and, and challenges um, became clear. Um, and then in the three years since, we have done so little to begin to combat them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And while we're talking about the, the risks involved in this case, um, I know that unfortunately there have been security threats against your team. And I'm wondering, if you can tell us a little bit about the ways that you all have been increasing security for yourselves as you're building safety for all of us, um, given that some of those practices are things that um, we as a larger movement need to collectively be taking on and practicing. Yeah, it's it's been, you know, my mother's not on this session, which is always a good thing when I talk about this question. Um, you know, it's not surprising that the defendants in our suit and their her supporters have tried everything they can do to avoid accountability here. And that includes, of course, avoiding discovery obligations, flouting court orders. Some have even been thrown in jail for contempt of court. But that also includes using threats and other attempts at harassment to try to dissuade us from doing this work. Um, and we see it firsthand. They, they target us in a variety of ways. Some directly threaten us, like Chris Cantwell, um, known as the crying Nazi, if you saw that doc, the Vice documentary on Charlottesville, and he was featured in, I think, both videos um, that we showed today, um, has has literally threatened our legal team, um, talking about all the fun he's going to have with our lead attorney, Roberta Kaplan, when this is over. Um, he, of course, is in jail right now for other threats he's made against a fellow white nationalist on the same platform, Telegram, a few days later. Um, others, you know, we get the obvious stuff, emails to me about dead Jews, um, it cartoons out of Nazi Germany. The fact that this is an effort led by Jewish women is particularly infuriating to the defendants, um, and they make that clear. Um, you know, you have some who people who are not direct defendants but are um, witnesses and otherwise involved in the case, like Mike Pinovich, who is a far right leader um, who has been on particular terror targeting me. I mentioned uh, the the noticer list, which seeks to target and harass. Um, Jews speaking out against white supremacy. Similarly, there was a list um, targeting interracial couples earlier this year on Telegram as well. Um, and so there's no shortage to talk about in this regard. Um, we get daily emails um, that make clear what's being said about us in our case um, and others involved on the dark web each night. I do not recommend reading something like that before you go to bed. It is not pleasant. Um, in, you know, and like, and yesterday's interspersed with their usual chatter about us was them also celebrating three years since Charlottesville, literally wishing each other a happy anniversary, which is as sick as you can imagine. Like, I'm never, I, it never fails me um, how they can still shock me. And, and, um, and then of course, when we go to trial, we are gonna require extensive 
physical security going to court each day um, for us, our legal team, our plaintiffs, our expert witnesses, because they've made clear that this is their intent here. And even if the defendants themselves are not, you know, of course they have their own capacity for violence. We saw it firsthand in Charlottesville, but the bigger concern in some ways is them inspiring their loyal social media followers to action as we've discussed. Mm -hmm. um, and so to be completely frank, it's why security is the biggest line item in IFA's budget. Every dollar we raise right now directly funds security and other sort of urgent case needs along those lines. Um, it's not going to massive legal fees or anything like that. Um, the reason we fundraise at IFA is to cover security and evidence collection and needs like that um, because of the unique nature of the suit. Right, right. Um, and um, at the end of the hour, we are going to give um, links for you all who want to be involved um, in supporting this work. Um, I actually want to turn that question around a little bit, though. On the flip side, how have um, some of your um, histories, lineages, identities been a source of strength for your team? Um, so you know, you saw our plaintiffs in the video we showed at the beginning. And I think sort of in some ways, they are the biggest source of the strength because I'm just so inspired and in awe of them. These are a coalition of Charlottesville communities of many races, many religions, many backgrounds. Some are students, some um, are young professionals, one is a reverend. And they lived through and survived this awful, awful attack on them personally in their community. A few of them were at the car, uh, were at the protest with Heather Heyer. Um, Marissa Blair, one of our plaintiffs, was co workers with Heather, which is how they all ended up there. Um, and they lived through this horror. And instead of sort of curling up in a ball and deciding to be angry, they've channeled it into this effort, which can have major impacts and win accountability and justice, not just for their community and themselves, but have national impacts on the movement that so directly targeted them and their city. And I'm just in awe of them for doing so. And I like I, I derive so much strength from them. Um, I'm also the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And so I think a lot about my family history here and what my family, you know, my my both my grandparents, their families were virtually wiped out by the Nazis in the 30s and 40s um, in Poland and Russia. Um, and or what was then those countries. Um, and they survived, uh, reconnected at a displaced person's camp and came to America with hope of a better life and raised a proud Jewish daughter who raised me. And here we are. And the idea that in 2017 in America, and of course, many times since neo-Nazis can so flagrantly attack Jews, African Americans, Latinx community, LGBTQ community members, and so many others. Um, with the same exact Nazi language and violence that my grandparents survived is heinous. But here's the difference. We live in a country that, at least right now, still, and we're going to fight like hell to keep it that way, is predicated on the rule of law, has a justice system, has statutes like the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, and we're going to use them to fight back, which is exactly what we're doing. And so that gives me a lot of optimism as well. It's it's heartbreaking to think about where we are, but it's also what gives me optimism in this moment. Thank you, Amy. Um, I want to actually turn now to some questions that people have been asking because there's been some um, great questions coming in. And um, for those of you who want to get your question in before the end, if you um, uh, click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, then you should uh, be able to put in a question that way. Um, and a few of these are coming from different angles on the questions around um, social media. Um, and so one question, I'm going to ask a couple of them together so you can, you can run with it, um, is, you know, how have you or your team or folks that you're working with um, been in communication with those in those leadership positions at Telegram or Gab or these other platforms um, that are not monitoring um, any of the hate language? And what, what has their response been to um, pressure that's been placed on them? Um, and then related to that, there's a question about what are some of the best practices or tactics um, for people who are not, you know, part of this case, but are at home and, and you know, on social media, 
um, to push back against instances of white supremacy, like when it comes up as comments or images in a social media feed or um, when there's, you know, videos planted. So from both a, um, a larger institutional and, and also from an individual um, perspective, what are, what are some of the ways in which people can fight back and, and what have you seen for responses? Yeah, I think it's worth distinguishing between sort of two buckets of social media sites just to keep it, just to sort of, you can distinguish in other ways, but for the sake of our limited time here. The first are the companies where, like the Facebooks, Twitters, Instagrams, YouTubes, et cetera, where hypothetically we can try to change the behavior in some way. And, I'll, and, and there are many efforts right now to do so. Change the terms, accountability text, stop hate for profit. These are all campaigns and organizations that have sprung up in recent years to do just that. And they're doing extraordinary work. And I would recommend checking them out, getting involved, signing up, um, because they're doing such critical work right now to hold accountable these social media companies to the values that they in some cases, just pretend to espouse. Um, others, you know, like I always, there's, there are there are definitely tech companies who are trying or at least starting to try to do the right thing. One of the examples I always like to point to is not a social media company, but Airbnb. Um, in the, I have so many. We all probably have many feelings about Airbnb, um, but in the uh, in the lead up to Charlottesville three years ago, they actually started canceling reservations. Um, for people who were clearly coming to Charlottesville with the intent to terrorize the community. And that's something that a tech company can do that is sort of, you know, figuring out within their terms of service. Like, yeah, if you're coming to a community to terrorize it, that does not fit within terms of service. The same way that sp espousing racism, anti-Semitism and white nationalism on Facebook doesn't, shouldn't fit within Facebook's terms of services. So putting the pressure on companies that whose behavior can hypothetically be changed in some way. If, I think obviously we all know that that is a hard battle and, and you know there's a much larger discussion happening on this on a variety of levels, including on the legislative level right now. But then there are also the companies like the Gabs, Telegrams, 4chans, 8chans of the world, whose entire business models are built on extremism. And in those cases, it's the domain registration companies and the web hosting companies that can have an impact. Some have already pulled web hosting and registration from some of these um, websites. There's no reason that major companies in those spaces should be giving license to sites like the ones I described to run extremism factories, which is what they are. Um, and so understanding that distinction, doing the advocacy and the boycotts and the other work on the first bucket that are currently happening um, to hold them accountable and try to change the behavior, and putting pressure through the back end through web hosting and domain registration companies and otherwise um, on the second bucket um, are things that we can all do. And I think particularly people who are, might be at Netroots are well positioned to take action in this space. Thanks, Amy. Um, this is Dub again. And um, I actually wanted to make sure that there's a chance to say very specifically that what, um, and this is a question that came in as well, what would, what does success look like in this case? That what is the ultimate goal? Um, I would say there are three key goals here. The first and most important is justice for our plaintiffs and accountability for the defendants. James Fields, who drove that car, did not act alone. He was part of this racist, violent conspiracy, and there has been so little accountability in the aftermath of Charlottesville, both because of the lack of interest, to put it lightly, by DOJ um, and other prosecutors, um, and just because of the, the news cycle we're in, frankly, we, we move on so quickly. There was three years since neo-Nazis attacked an American city and, you know, it got a, a little bit of mention yesterday and, but not much. Um, and there needs to be accountability here. So winning accountability against the leaders and the groups directly responsible for orchestrating this weekend of violence is key. But as I described, they are also at the center of this larger movement. And so by taking them on in court, bankrupting them and dismantling them, we will have much uh, broader impacts. We are already starting to see those impacts and I think we'll drop a link into chat that describes them. Um, specifically, we've won over $41,000 in sanctions against three key defendants. Richard Spencer has complained in court that our case is quote, financially crippling, which was heartening to hear. Um, he also, by the way, made clear on the record in court that deplatforming works when he said that 
uh, it was making it a lot harder for him to raise money. So when we're talking about what social media companies can do, take it from Richard Spencer himself, it works. Um, and of course, when we go to trial this fall, we are scheduled for trial in October. I don't know if I mentioned that. Nothing else is of course happening in October. So um, it will be a very quiet fall for all of us. Um, but when we go to uh, trial this fall and win large civil judgments against them, um, it will have an infinitely larger impact bankrupting and dismantling those at the center of this movement. And then finally, it's about the precedent, the deterrent, the message that this case sends. Both having a trial in Charlottesville blocks away from Heather Higher Way where the violence unfolded, putting the leaders of this movement on the stand and making crystal clear that there are serious financial, legal and operational penalties for being part of these racist violent conspiracies is going to sort of help spark a national conversation on the crisis of violent extremism um, in ways that sadly have, have sort of fallen under the radar so far and we will do our very best to ensure it stays on the radar throughout trial um, and send a crystal clear message to anyone who might be considering getting involved in this form of violent hate. We're not going to eliminate violent hate, but we can push the people who are inclined to be part of these conspiracies and this violence back underground where they belong. Um, and this case will play a critical role in doing so. So accountability and justice, bankrupting and dismantling the leaders of this movement and making crystal clear if you are part of these efforts, you will face very real, very severe consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, a piece of that um, and uh, that folks are also wondering is about kind of where's the federal government here? Um, and what do you see or what does Integrity First for America see as the federal government's role in the fight against white supremacist violence? Well, in normal times, this is a case and these are issues that DOJ Civil Rights Division would be all over hypothetically. This is quite literally what the Civil Rights Division was helped was started to help do to take on assaults on American civil rights, which is what happened in Charlottesville and so many times since. Um, but they've, they're clearly disinterested again, to put it lightly and have dramatically cut their investigations and prosecutions in this regard. Um, and so it falls to private plaintiffs like ours. IFA, Integrity First for America, was created in 2017, knowing that at that point, the Jeff Sessions DOJ, and certainly it hasn't changed with the Barr DOJ, would be totally disengaged and in some cases actively working against the civil rights work that we desperately need. And that has, of course, borne out. And so it makes private plaintiffs like ours key. There is legislation. I, we, we alluded to some of them. There's like the No Hate Act, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, which are some basic bills to close gaps in reporting um, and other uh, and on the hate crimes front. Um, those are important, but it needs to be a multifaceted effort from all pieces of the federal government using the courts like we are, um, and also recognizing the role of state and local governments in uh, in in holding perpetrators of hate crimes and other um, violent hate accountable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think just to add on that of what we've seen is not only uh, this administration um, not taking the action that others have um, in, in past times, but also that there's actually been a support um, being expressed for um, these attacks being expressed, if not for the attacks for um, the leaders um, of these movements and those connections being made. And so I think this also pulls in that one of the tactics that we know is that we need to change leadership both at the federal and the state level. Um, and uh, many of the folks that are here with us are involved in doing that as well. Um, I think also something that we want to, you know, make sure to be clear on this uh, panel that we started at the beginning, which is that um, this, these uh, movements, white supremacist and white nationalist movements, really do come out of the systems of white supremacy that, ha that um, have been with us for 400 years and that are still organizing the way society is built. Um, therefore, there is a real link between the work that movements are doing to end systemic white supremacy um, in all uh, parts of our society um, and the work that has been doing against specifically the white nationalist movements. And so I think that that's something that we really want to make sure folks leave today knowing that um, that 
through movement ecology, we are putting those pieces together and we really want to um, support people thinking very widely about the different levels of movement ecology that we can be um, uh, embodying at this time. Um, I, we've just got like a minute left. So um, for folks that want more information, um, we just put up the link. Um, you can sign up for case updates from Integrity First for America um, at this link, click there. Um, also, if you are interested in um, being involved from a grassroots organizing perspective and or from a, um, uh, leadership change perspective, doing electoral work. Um, Want to put in the link, you can join um, Ben the Arc's campaign, um, We Rise as One. There are ways where you can be getting um, regular updates um, about um, members of leadership and Republican Party that are um, involved in incidents or connected to um, leaders of these movements. Um, and um, you can get uh, weekly alerts um, to keep you on top of the news and also um, ways in which you can join direct voter contact work um, that we are doing in some key states right now. Um, so uh, click on those links. Uh, you can learn more as we go. Stay connected to us. Um, stay connected to this work that's happening. Um, and uh, Amy, I just really want to thank you and your team. I know that you all are under a lot of pressure and a lot of risk. And um, thank you for the work you're doing on behalf of the extremely uh, brave plaintiffs that you are representing. And thank you on behalf of all of us for this uh, tactic that you are moving so powerfully. And thank you for being an incredible partner in this work and making clear just how pervasive the white nationalism and white supremacy we're taking on is um, in our country right now and using every tool we have to, to fight back. Let's do it. Thank Let's you all of you for, for taking the time to make this your first session. And we'll see you around the conference. Yeah. Thanks, all of you. Thanks for all the work that you do. And just really glad to be in it with you.